Good morning. Welcome to our morning devotional here from the Central Church of Christ in Hereford, Texas. This is Thursday, April the 29th, and it's so good to have you with us this morning. It's a beautiful day here in the Texas Panhandle, a beautiful day as we have opportunity to come together around God's word and to consider some things, some events from the life of his son, Jesus, while he was here upon this earth. Let's begin our time together with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into our lesson. Bow with me, please. Loving Father, we pause to come into your presence this morning and just to bring before you our petitions, our desires, and our gratitude for who you are and for what you do in our lives and for your granting of our petitions and many, many instances, but we know, Father, that even if it's no, it's an answer uh, to the prayer that we've, we've given. We thank you, Father, for this avenue of prayer. Father, we continue to be mindful of those who are sick, uh, whether it be from different uh, diseases or injuries, uh, COVID-19 or whatever it may be. We pray, Father, for them, and we lift them up before you they're caregivers, and we're so grateful for those medical personnel and the, the knowledge and the expertise that you have blessed them with, that they can help us to take care of our health. And, and when we are uh, sick, they can help us to get well. Be with us, Father, as we look into your word this morning to see uh, the actions of your son while he was here upon this earth. And as we see these, may we see... Uh, the things about him that will encourage us and uh, help us to grow in our strength and in our faith, our trust in you and in him. We thank you for your word that tells us about it, tells us about his prophecy of his coming, his being here, and the fact that he's ascended now to heaven after his death, burial, and resurrection, where he's seated at your right hand, but that one day, Father, he's coming back. Uh, to claim his own, and they will go to meet him in the air and be with him and with you and all the redeemed of all the ages forever and ever. We pray this in the name of your son. Amen. Well, <clears throat> today in our morning moment with Jesus, we want to continue looking at his actions and deeds early in what is known as his great Galilean ministry. Specifically today, I want us to take a look at his move to Capernaum and then the calling of the first four uh, disciples to become fishers of men. Let's start by opening our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, we're going to read verses 13 through 16 where they tell us about uh, his move to Capernaum and make a few comments about that. And then we're going to switch for the calling of the uh, four fishermen to Luke's account in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. So let's start in Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 13 through 16. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the lands and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Jesus, as we saw yesterday, has just been rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. And he leaves there. He moves to not too far away to a city called Capernaum. This is a significant move for Jesus. It is a larger city. It offers him more visibility, more opportunity to preach. It also demonstrates his thorough rejection by the people of Nazareth. 
for the next year or more, Capernaum is going to be the headquarters of Jesus' campaigns. Capernaum is located at the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee and provides a multicultural commercial center for Jesus' preaching. Prior to the Assyrian captivity in 722 BC, this area had been allotted to the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, two of the 12 tribes of Israel. It was taken over by foreigners after Israel was deported uh, to Assyria uh, to begin what is known as the Assyrian captivity. Now, you'll recall that Israel and Judah have separated and uh, the 10 tribes of the north known as Israel and the two tribes of the south known as, as Judah. So the 10 tribes go into captivity and foreigners move in to the lands where that they once had occupied. Even in Jesus' day, it is estimated that up to 50% of the population of the area is Gentile. It is called Galilee of the Gentiles, as we just saw in the passage from Isaiah that Matthew get, uh, records for us or tells us about. It is called that because it is inhabited by Egyptians, Arabians, and Phoenicians, as well as a Jewish population. Again, about half the population is Jewish. Matthew lets us know that Jesus' move to Capernaum was in fulfillment of prophecy, found in Isaiah chapter 9 in the first two verses. Now, this is a well-known messianic prophecy in the day, and this was one of the things that the Jewish people would be looking for on the part of the Messiah. Jesus never owned a home in Capernaum, but some of his disciples did. From this time on, his Galilean ministry, Jesus would never be gone long from the city of Capernaum. He would leave that city from time to time and go out on tours, but he would always return there during this time period of his ministry. Almost everything is in place now for Jesus to begin a very aggressive campaign of preaching and teaching and healing in Galilee. He only needs one more component, and that is full-time disciples. Matthew 4, Mark 1, and, Math and Luke 5 tell us about the call of four fishermen, Peter, his brother Andrew, James, his brother John. Actually, this you will, you will recall is the second call for these men, for they had been among Jesus' followers, his disciples, during his early Judean ministry that we looked at last week. John chapter 1, verses 40 and 41, specifically mentions Andrew, who went and found his brother Peter. When we spoke of that passage last week, we noted that an unnamed disciple is spoken of there, and we suggested that in all likelihood, this is the Apostle John, or who, one who would be known as later the Apostle John. We also noted that the wording of the text more than likely suggests that John, like Andrew, went and found his brother, James, in the same way Andrew had found Peter. All right. I want us to turn now over to Luke's account, Luke chapter 5, and we're going to read starting with the first three verses to see Luke's account of the calling of these four men. Luke 5, beginning in verse 1. Now it happened that while the crowd was pass pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, 
and ask him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. Jesus called these four men, two pairs of brothers, as we've said, all aligned together, apparently in a, a partners in a fishing business, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They worked primarily on the Sea of Galilee. Now, Luke calls it here uh, Gennesaret, the Lake of Gennesaret. It's also known as Chitteroth, and sometimes it's called the Sea of Tiberias. These all refer to the same body of water. And it is actually, as Luke calls it, a lake, not a sea. It is pear-shaped, roughly, about 12 miles from north to south, and seven miles across at its widest. Interestingly, it sits in a basin 682 feet below sea level. It is surrounded by a perimeter of very high hills reaching as high as 1,000 feet. It is teeming with fish. The Jordan River empties into it on the north end and comes out of it on the south end to go on down south to the Dead Sea. Because it is teeming with fish, naturally then, fishing is a big business on the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret. As Luke tells it, as Jesus is walking along the shoreline, Fishermen are there cleaning their nets. They've been working, fishing all night without any success. This is now the nuisance part of their work, meticulously cleaning and washing, getting the pebbles and the grass and the sand that's become entangled in the nets and repairing them where they are torn after heavy use of fishing all night. These are commercial fishermen. This is their livelihood. This is the way they earn their living. Simon, Peter, and Andrew are the first that Jesus encounters. They are casting their nets in the shallow waters close by the shore and cleaning them and perhaps in the casting or also do, you know, washing away the sand and grasses and all. And the crowds are pressing in upon Jesus, wanting to hear more. He's already so popular that he cannot move about freely. So Jesus employs Peter's empty fishing boat as a pulpit and uses the shore as an amphitheater, which it very naturally was. Remember, we talked about it's almost 900, or excuse me, almost 700 feet below sea level with a thousand feet high hills above it. So that's 1,700 feet from the top of the hills down to the shoreline. Let's go back to Luke now and be, read verses four through seven. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we have worked all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. Interesting thing that Jesus does here. He finishes speaking to the crowds and he turns to Peter and he says, put out into the deep water and put, let down your nets for a catch. I can almost imagine Peter looking at Jesus and turning to look at Andrew and maybe over at James and John and thinking, 
What? They fished all night. They've caught nothing. Now remember, we said this is commercial fishermen. These are, are men that earn their living fishing. These are large boats, heavy nets. These are their major means of support. Furthermore, they had just finished cleaning them. He pro Peter protests just a little bit, saying that we fished all night and caught nothing. But then he says, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. Peter is a commercial fisherman, a professional. He knows the lake. He knows the sweet spots to fish. And he knows the chances of going back, right back out in the morning after being out there all night trying to fish now. Nevertheless, Peter had seen Jesus' actions before. More than a year ago, as he followed John the baptizer, he had seen Jesus baptized by John. He had watched Jesus cleanse the temple in Jerusalem, and he was with Jesus in Samaria on their way back to Galilee after Jesus spoke with the woman at the well. He had witnessed the healings in, in Judea. He had witnessed the transformation of the water to wine in Cana. After nearly nine months of following Jesus, Peter had gone back, though, to his family fishing business at the lake. Meanwhile, Jesus has been preaching in his hometown and around Nazareth. Now they're reunited. And Jesus makes this simple, although from Peter's perspective, perhaps absurd request. Because of Peter's respect and trust in Jesus, he obeys. Imagine, as Peter pulls up the nets, his muscles flex, his eyes bug out, and an involuntary smile breaks out all over his face as he realizes and sees the large number of fish that, that the nets have captured. And as they bring them up, they are, are beginning to tear and their boat is beginning to sink. And his smile becomes a grimace and he knows that he needs some help. He beckons to his partners and the second boat comes over to help and Peter, James and John are manning this boat and they come alongside and, and, and they begin helping to bring in this remarkable catch of fish. Let's pick up in verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Well, let's pause right there in the middle of verse 10. After they got their boats steadied and the fish into the boats and their, their hearts have stopped pounding from the exertion and the excitement, Peter falls to his knees at the feet of Jesus. He had just seen Jesus, really seen him for who he is. He says, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Peter's thinking correctly. He, unlike the crowds, is not selfishly seeking a miracle. And the miracle that has just happened is a fearful one to him. He was personally touched by it. 
He is thinking about what it means to be in the presence of perfect purity. Jesus' purity demands obedience and ushers in judgment. Now let's read the rest of verse 10 and, and verse 11 and bring our thoughts this morning to a close. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. It is at this time that Jesus uses their present occupation to call them in a way that they can visualize. Luke's account says, from now on, you will be catching men. In Matthew 4, 19 and Mark 1, verse 17, they say, come and I will make you fishers of men. The word that Luke uses here, tra translated capture, is one that does not mean to fish, but rather it means to take live captives. Jesus is not asking them to trap or to capture men, but he's asking them to simply come and learn how to collect men into the kingdom of God. And Luke says, Peter and Andrew respond immediately to the call of Jesus by leaving everything and following him. Now, according to Matthew and Mark in their accounts, the three men, Jesus, Peter, and Andrew, walk a short ways further and encounter their partners, James and John, whom Jesus also calls, and they likewise respond in the same way, leaving their father in the boat with the hired servants, Mark 1, verse 20. Now, this call may seem too sudden to merit such a drastic response. But remember, these four have already traveled with Jesus in Judea and through Samaria and a little bit in Galilee for almost a year now. And they have just witnessed this miraculous catch of fish. Jesus has entered into their domain and proven his power. He now calls them into his domain to be empowered to fish for men. So in this way, Jesus called the first men to permanent, uninterrupted discipleship. The event would have far-reaching consequences. Not only would Jesus now have companionship day and night, but these four would also become one third of the group of 12 that would be selected to be apostles later in the ministry of Jesus. Further, three of these four, Peter, James, and John, would become part of Jesus' inner circle. Everything is now ready for Jesus' great Galilean ministry. Bow with me as we close, and then I'll have a comment about tomorrow. Father, thank you again for all your word that teaches us about your son and about the life that he spent upon this earth. Thank you for his following your plan. Thank you for his faith and his trust in you and his love for us to give his life for us in obedience to your plan. Help us, Father, to be like Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and that is to follow him wholeheartedly and with a 100% devotion in the things that we do and to, to do the things that he says. Be with us this day that we may have a, a blessed day and that we may glorify you in everything that we do. We thank you again for the Christ. And we pray in that and all of this in his wonderful name. Amen. Well, tomorrow I want us to look at two miracles that take place in Capernaum that are that take place on the same day. They're rec it's recorded in all three of the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I want us to primarily, though, look at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 
through 34. We'll see you then. In the meantime, have a great day and seek always to do God's will.